All righty. So um, I've got a few cases for this week. And thanks, Howard, for, for hosting last week. Um, I wanted to get your guys' thought on this case. Um, this is just a, I can't remember why we're doing it, but it has a congenital anomaly, one I find kind of fun. And let me spell it on here. You need to should see a CT scan. How are we doing? Good. Yeah, okay. So nice example of a tracheal bronchus. I think everyone can see, and I'll show the coronal. But you'll notice that the anterior and posterior segments seem to come off fairly early, sort of right at or maybe just above the crina. And then we've got a bronchus intermedius. The other cool thing is there's an anomalous left bronchus. So follows the rule of multiple anomalies where it comes off behind the artery. And then there's this odd fissure up in the left upper lobe with some tree and bud, so some inflammatory stuff. But um, I was interested because I wonder if, if I could convince you guys, or maybe it's sort of just on the fence, is this maybe a double tracheal bronchus? And it, so this is sort of the carina plane here, and this is just kind of an early takeoff. And there's the tracheal bronchus there, or is it just a... That's, yeah, that's a cool image. Yeah, that's a nice image. It is odd. Yeah, I've had people tell me it looks like different things, an octopus, sort of, you know, cephalopod with some limbs. Chinese character. Chinese character, yeah, I heard that one too. But it's interesting because it's, it, it almost looks like a true, I mean, if we're arguing this is the carina, this should be the start of the upper lobe bronchus. Mm. I mean, the bronchus intermediate, so in theory, it's a double tracheal bronchus. Yeah. And then you've got the anomalous airway on this side that comes off behind, and I don't know why this little weird fissure is just... But it goes along with the, you know, when there's one, there's often others. Yeah, that is interesting. Wow. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it up and if David comes on, I'll see what he thinks too. But yeah, I thought that was kind of fun. I've got Mark Shiva with me and that's great because I'm going to let him show this case. Uh, <laughs> this is a great case and he's much better at the cardiac MR stuff than I am. So let me go ahead and load it up and uh, share the right window. All right. All you, Mark. So I'm like a, a, a Dell person, so uh, this Osirix, I'm not sure I'm so good at it. So this is a 31-year-old uh, guy. He uh, comes in with malaise, and um, he's uh, got a wide QRS complex and tachyarrhythmia, and they don't know what to do with him. He coded, and then he comes to us because the other hospital uh, down in a small city, I won't name the city, did not know what to do with him. And if you notice on the steady state free procession images, there's a little bit of increased signal in here. I'm not sure if I can show that. Yeah. You see the increased signal intensity in here. So there's some elevated water or T2 uh, products in here that are there. And then we'll go to the, let's see. Just bear with me while I, uh, you can see the motion is abnormal. There's septal dyskinesis. There's a so this is three chamber, two chamber, and four chamber. There's septal, basically akinesis. There is a paradoxical motion of the septum, and this winds up being a thrombus. And then we'll go to the um, delayed enhancement images. Uh, let's just try this. So what you're seeing is a LAD territory, a full thickness or transmural infarct with uh, no reflow, and the subventricular portion here. And then this winds up being an apical thrombus. So he's 31 years of age. Does anybody have a thought as to why a 31-year-old would have an LAD infarction? Either some sort of embolic phenomenon or he's drug user. So those are, uh, I think, very good thoughts. Uh, this is sort of one of those, uh, let's call it... Um, Upper North Woods, uh, Minnesota, and uh, Wisconsin, and Kentucky type of situations where the drug of choice is something you could cook. And so he was a methamphetamine smoker and, uh, and finally gave a history of, oh, yeah, three weeks ago, I was smoking my, uh, my pipe, my methamphetamine pipe, and I had severe chest pain and was doubled over. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is these meth users often get bad teeth, and the bad teeth is not from the meth smoke. It's from the diet Mountain Dew or the – actually, it's a full full bore Mountain Dew that they drink. And he gave a history of drinking six Mountain Dews a day. So while they're on their uh, uh, meth high, they will uh, 
self-medicate their uh, low sugars by drinking these sugary drinks and they destroy their teeth and stay up for seven days in a row. So this is a presumed case of spasm from uh, uh, smoking the, the, the methamphetamine pipe. Um, they, did the, they did the cath and it did show uh, a small septal perforator and then the LAD was occluded. So, all right, thanks Mark. All right. Thank you. All right, and I've got uh, two more here. This is one I, I think I sent around to a few of you. It's, it's a curiosity that goes along with my last one uh, here. So this is a, a CT with a nice example of an empty azagous fissure. And unfortunately, I couldn't find an old scan that showed it in situ, but it, presumably at some point there was an azagous in this fissure. But what was curious is this gas collection right underneath it here that looks like it's associated with the pleura. There is a little bronchus directed into it. So it's almost like a little lobe et or something that um, it has been there over many, many, many years that I could find. I never could see a, with, with unfortunately, because I didn't have one with the, uh, let me make this a little, a little cleaner there. But you can see, there it is. It looks like it has two layers of pleura, or at least a layer of pleura on each side. Um, and there's that little airway that may actually slide right by it, may go into it a little bit there. So I, I've just never seen, I'm trying to figure out where this gas is or how it got there, I have no clue. So Jeff, you think this is lung, or do you think this is a plural? I don't know. I I don't. I'm, I I guess it could be some lung, but I'm trying to explain why it has a plural covering. Is it where the azagus was and popped out? Yeah, it and popped out a negative uh, area where it once was. Yeah, usually it just tethers in fat or something. I don't know. Looks like maybe there's an airway associated with it. So I'm wondering if something at some point when this azagus dislodged, it somehow trapped some lung in there. And But trying to figure out, is this two layers of visceral pleura or what's what's left in this azagus fissure? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. All right. Anyway, I was, it's just one of these weird things. We've talked about the escaped azagus veins before. All right, now this one's a fun case. Let me show you. This guy presented with hemoptysis. It's not a hard diagnosis, but uh, something we probably see a little bit more in the Midwest. And so this is an outside CT scan. And you can see he's got some calcifications in his mediastinal nodes. But he's got some thickening of the anterior tracheal wall, a little bit of distress of calcification. And then he's got this filling defect in the subcranial space, and it's got this chunky calcification. I'll show you we'll in this it. wall we'll thickening. We'll call you the uh, the coronal here. We can see see this thickening, and then clearly it's protruding uh, up against the airway. Uh, so this is a broncholith, uh, presumably from his stow. You can see. Let's see for David. Yep, there are the splenic calcifications. So this is mm -hmm. his stow for sure. Yeah. And I've got the uh, this is the bronchoscopy, and you can see there it is, big chunk of stuff down there. A lot of blood, but uh, yeah, this is all the stuff they, they removed. Some chunks of calcium in there and uh, there. And then this is a bronch the next day. And hopefully this is showing. Yeah, you can see it's still pretty inflamed and angry in there, but um, they did relieve the obstruction. Um, still an extrinsic compression that we see right here. So, uh, you know, we see these calcified nodes in almost every CT, probably 60, 70 percent easily. Uh, but it's un uncommon to see them actually get big enough or cause enough mass effect or erosion. Uh, but usually they present with hemoptysis or either that or some obstructive atelectasis. But this one clearly has been brewing for a while, very angry, thickened walls. Um, and they just, uh, they can't usually remove the whole thing, but they go in and clean up the airways uh, using uh, mechanical. They can use laser um, to, to deal with this. So wow. bronchalith with pre and post uh Bronk images, and uh, that's what I have for the week. So, who would like to show the next set of cases? I have uh, two two quickies. All righty. Okay, so <clears throat> this man presented with um, <clears throat> ten days of chest discomfort. Uh, it was pretty bad. He was treated in an outside emergency room for seven days with some anti-inflammatory, I think it was put on Tylenol or ibuprofen or something like that. And um, 
he finally developed a fever and a shaking chill. And uh, he came in with this radiograph here with multiple fluid levels and this lateral pleural stripe. And on CT, he has um, loculated pleural fluid collections with gas. And this is before any instrumentation. So there's not been any introduction of air caused by um, doctors. He's got very nice pleural thickening and enhancement here. So it's clearly an inflammatory thing. And this has been going on at this point for about 10 days. And I think we can actually see the entry of gas from the lung into this. So I think we can track back these little gas collections um, from the pleural space here back into central airways. And we can make the whole pathway of gas getting into this pleural space through a bronchal pleural fistula right about down here, I think. So visible bronchal pleural fistula allowing gas to get into the pleural space. And the organisms that were, uh, this man has a history of GERD and he's on omeprazole. And the organisms they cultured out of this were um, Campylobacter, Rectus, and a Fusobacterium species. So these are both aspiration organisms. And the interesting thing about Campylobacter is it's associated with eating contaminated meats like, like poultry, but it can also be from contaminated water. And most Campylobacter is killed by gastric acid. And this fellow was on, being on omeprazole was suppressing his gastric acid, and that may be one reason why his Campylobacter you know, infection uh, wasn't quenched. Um, on the other hand, you know, this stuff probably got into his lung bypassing his stomach, so maybe you don't need gastric acid in your lung to, to stop you from getting Campylobacter, but it's the first time I've ever heard of a Campylobacter empyema like this. So very classic bronchial pleural fistula, I think, with a visible connection and unusual organism in this case. David, you know, it's interesting. Look how hypertrophied the extra pleural fat is on the right. And just, you said it was only about 10 days. Because I usually think of that as a sign of chronicity, like TB or something that's been smoldering for some time. But that's a striking amount of extra pleural fat. I agree. Yeah. I think everything's being pulled in by this pleural process here. Notice the mediastinum is also rotated in that direction a little bit. So I think there's a lot of traction on this fat, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's um, thicker than, than, than it is on the other side. We don't really see much. It doesn't look particularly, doesn't look particularly infiltrated, though. It's no. not as brandy no. as it often is with the inflammation. Yeah. Okay, and um, this other case, let me switch gears here. Um, this is a, um, I'll show you later in the course of this. Well, um, this is a woman with uh, sickle cell anemia who uh, was admitted with an acute chest syndrome. And this is one of the more <clears throat> dramatic cases I've seen. <clears throat> this is about her last radiograph before she died. So she's got this diffuse lung disease. If we back up to her baseline state, here's, um, here's an earlier set of radiographs to show you how bad she was. At, at baseline, so low lung volume, sort of diffuse, busy looking lungs, dirty looking lungs, probably from remote, small infarctions and infections. Cardiomegaly, she had pulmonary hypertension and, um, and cardiomegaly, she'd had, and she has an SVC stent because of occlusion, she's got a lot of bone sclerosis, so sort of a classic chronic sickle pattern. And then she was admitted in February and um, her radiograph began to cloud up. And so day by day, she got more and more lung stuff. They did, you know, aggressive um, trying to resuscitate her and clear out this. They considered exchange transfusions and all that, but the course was downward. And she had renal failure and everything like that and then died. And at postmortem, um, they found diffuse alveolar damage. They found... Um, small uh, infarctions in the lung, probably from in situ thrombosis. And they found some bizarre uh, calcifications out along pleural surfaces. And so I wanted, uh, I've asked the pathologist to go back and look at those calcifications and try to help figure out what they are because I've seen these and now, I think this is the third or fourth sickler that I've seen this kind of calcification, which at first blush looks like dendroform pulmonary ossification.
but it's really different, I think, in its distribution. So look at these calcific nodules along pleural surfaces in the bases here on both sides. So these were described as lung nodules on the, by, by the, the first pathology that I have back um, along these pleural surfaces. And look how extensive it is out here. And this is non-contrast uh, CT, so we're not seeing you know, vascular opacification here. This is calcification, seems to be in the lung against pleural surfaces. I've seen clumpy calcifications like this in lower independent parts of the lung before in, in other sicklers. This is my first chance to actually have path of what this is. So I wonder if you guys have ever seen this before. I, you know, I wonder what is causing this. I asked our pathologist to tell me, is, is this just calcification or is this uh, ossification by any chance? Could this be something related to DPO? Now, this person has you know, a complicated medical history. There was hemochromatosis of the heart and liver on the autopsy findings. There was renal failure. Kidneys are normal in size here. It's possible, I think, we have to consider that this might be some unusual pattern of renal, um, you know, metastatic calcification in the setting of renal failure, but I've never seen it in this distribution before. So I wonder if you guys have seen calcifications in sicklers that might be related to the sickling process, perhaps to small vascular occlusions or something like that, and ultimate calcification to platelets turning, you know, attracting calcium or something like that. Has anybody seen anything like this before? No, I haven't. Never seen that either live or in a book, even. Not that I recall. Yeah. No, it's striking because it looks like the spleen does with with its auto infarction there. Yeah. I so I think some sort of infarction is probably the best way to to parse this, and maybe that maybe the vessels are really tiny. Uh, the capillaries, you know, we're at, at the end of capillaries when in subpleural regions like this. And therefore, if there's thrombosis, um, the thrombus could lead to, in situ thrombosis, it could lead to calcification. So I'll see if the pathologist can contribute anything when they look at these uh, calcified nodules in more detail. But I think we all probably agree it doesn't look like the typical dendroform ossification. Right. They're big, they're quite large. Yeah. As well. Okay, and it doesn't look like the usual metastatic calcification either no. of renal failure. Okay, well, maybe we'll get some pathologic insight. I'll pass on. So those are the two cases I wanted to show. All right. Thank you, David. Who's up next? Howard, I've got plenty, I've got plenty of cases. I don't know what – if you have some, we can go back and forth, or, or if there are other people, it doesn't look like it. I can show mine relatively quickly if that's okay. Sure. Sure, okay. These are nice, but they're quite quick, except maybe for one. Let me just pick out the um, the ones that are quite quick. Uh, we've talked about this scenario before. Uh, we tend to see this in the context of laparoscopic repair of hiatal hernias or paraesophageal hernias. Typically, in my experience, they don't necessarily get a chest radiograph um, after that kind of surgery, but here's one in which they did get a radiograph. I'm not entirely sure why. The person is still intubated, and there is a temperature monitoring probe in the esophagus, and you can see there's a lot of gas, certainly consistent with carbon dioxide in a bunch of places, particularly the pleural space, and typically we say that carbon dioxide is something that's very soluble. It can be reabsorbed very quickly. They don't put a chest tube in. So here we have, in terms of time, 9.10 a.m. to 3.10 p.m. on the same day. And you can see this holds true. So all of that stuff has all gone away. There's some atelectasis there. But all that carbon dioxide gas in the mediastinum and the pleural space, particularly on the right side, has been resorbed completely in that short period of time. So that's a nice example of of that phenomenon. That is impressive. Yeah. I showed a case a couple of weeks ago of a person that came in. Um, we didn't see the finding, which turned out to be subglottic stenosis, but I showed a CT and showed you an example of what I thought was lung edema, so-called negative pressure edema in the context of, in that patient, a subglottic stenosis. 
Uh, this one was the other day, not too long ago. And here is a person, you come across a bedside radiograph, you get no history, you look at it and you say, well, you can see what's wrong, but we don't know what's going on. And I started looking around, looking at the chart, and it took me quite a while to find a note written by an anesthesiologist in the context of surgery, which wasn't the first thing I was looking for, an anesthesia note. But I did find it, and the description of the note said, post-extubation laryngospasm in the recovery room. And then I said, bingo. So here's a really nice example of so-called negative pressure lung edema as a consequence of laryngospasm. So that's the, uh, let's see, in time here we have the same day. Um, still has quite a bit at 4.20 in the afternoon, but you can see he's not intubated. And as best I can tell, he just recovered and, and then was discharged. So by virtue of context and the imaging findings, a very nice example of that form of airway occlusion or airway narrowing associated lung edema. Here is a nice example of something I've showed before. Um, unless you kind of know the context and look really carefully, you'll go right by this. So this is a pacemaker and I'm not quite sure what made me <clears throat> perhaps more than usual Usually what I do when I look at these, particularly for a particular cardiologist, I start zooming up like this and looking for something in particular. So this is subtle, so I'll put up the lateral. And if you were to sort of look at it like this, um, you wouldn't see very much. So you have to really zoom in. And if you do zoom in, then you'll see this. So this is a really nice example of so-called externalization of a RIATA, that's the brand name, R-I-A-T-A, externalization of a RIATA lead that needs to be replaced. So this is a known complication of this particular pacemaker lead. And if you get the history, then you're gonna to have to mag in and hope there's not too much motion of the lead so that you can see this. So right here is the place where it's externalized, so-called, and these need to be replaced. So a nice example of that. This one is really interesting. I'm going to put up on the um, right side this person's cardiac history, and you can see it's pretty extensive. So she had a lot of congenital heart disease. She had a BT shunt, and she has been followed over time. So there's kind of the background that explains why we see the cardiac findings and why we see findings of pulmonary hypertension and very dilated pulmonary arteries. So with that as the background, here is a time that you came in fairly recently. So let me put this one there and this one here. And you can see here is from last year and more recently that we have massive pulmonary arteries, but she has new opacity in the right lower lung. So here we go from January now to April, and you'll see that on this particular occasion, she has a lot of opacity in the right lower hemithorax, a lot of what turns out to be atelectatic and consolidated lung. Here is an image in terms of the timing of things, 4-3, sorry about that, compared to 4-4, four, four. so definitely a big problem down here. Now let me show you the CT from September of 14, which I have for comparison with the CT that was done here. This was done without contrast. And actually I wasn't, when I started looking at this, I wasn't quite sure why they did the CT because they didn't provide any history. And it took me a while to, to figure out what to sort of look for. So let me just show you this. The image that shows the finding is right here. So in relation to the bronchus intermedius, then and now. So for timing again, July of 2014 and April of this year, notice how big the pulmonary artery is and know, see how compressed that bronchus intermedius is between the huge pulmonary artery and the spine. 
So I think um, for sure that she has persistent aeration problems of her right lower and middle lobes because of this narrowing. So secretions will accumulate, you don't ventilate. She's obviously recumbent here, you accumulate secretions. But I ascribe the imaging findings on the chest to this compression of that airway. And you can see some of the parenchymal disease there. Do you folks buy that? It's really very narrow with her recumbent like that. It's, it's a huge problem. It's almost, yeah, it's almost like a post pneumonectomy syndrome without the pneumonectomy. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, this is enormous, of course, and it's really narrow. It probably, it probably wouldn't have happened unless, without the spine being also deformed here and, and giving yes. the you know, medial part of the clamp here. Yeah. So I saw they deliberated about the possibility of a stent in the airway, but it seemed like, given her overall clinical condition, someone decided that at least now she may not derive long-term benefit from an airway stent. And I think that she's otherwise, her health's otherwise declining as well. So I think they're in the sort of palliation mode, but I think we understand why she presents with the right lower and right low, uh, middle lobe disease more recently. Like that. Okay, let me show uh, one more. Okay, this is a nice example of cardiac tumor, cardiac disease. You can see how extensive this process is, particularly in the region of the right atrioventricular groove. It is something that looks very infiltrative, involving heart muscle. You can see the effects on the adjacent chambers of the heart on that CT and how extensive this process is. And there's some pericardial fluid. So there are some MRIs which turn out to be not that great, so I'm not gonna show those. And let me bring up the clinical scenario here. So this turns out to be a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, as you see there. Um, interestingly, they didn't image the abdomen, that is the cardiac folks, before they went in to try to deal with his cardiac, but you can see he's got massive tumor involvement of the adrenal glands, and I'm trying to remember if he had nodal disease elsewhere, which he turned out to have. So this is extensive lymphoma with involvement of the heart as well. Let's see what it says here. You can see the operative report there. They couldn't really get it out and things didn't go well in general. So maybe positive diffuse large cell lymphoma with substantial cardiac cellular infiltration. Yeah, you can see the autopsy description right there and how extensive it is as well in the upper abdomen as well. Howard, that's a really nice mimic of a, an angiosarcoma given the location. And we were whispering in the background here that I was guessing it was gonna be lymphoma just because, okay. the, because the coronary artery, the right coronary artery is not dilated and hypervascular, you know, because usually the angiosarc will derive its blood supply from oh, the right see. coronary artery. So that's and, sort of fine that, um, yeah, so I don't I don't know if Mark is still on there with Jeff and if he agrees, but that's kind of usually I think about angiosarcs causing you know hyper or, or enlargement of the RCA. Yeah, okay. it's a good observation, uh, Travis. Uh, I didn't pick up on that. I I thought lymphoma and angiosarcoma, uh, angiosarcoma first, just by location. But yeah, point. right. One other thing, um, I can see some small branches coming off the right coronary. Do you typically lose those with an angiosarc just because they're harder masses or are they often preserved you can see like the the sinus um yeah. artery is nodal artery present right you can see a little conus branch there anteriorly that's a good question i don't know i just think of those i, I just remember that the most of the angiosarcs since they derive their blood flow from the rca the, the main vessel will be bigger i don't know about the side branches all right, I'll see if I have one readily available I can download uh, to this computer and we can see it with an angiosarc to see if we can see that. 
All right, those are my cases for this week. All right, thanks, Howard. All right, Travis. All right. You guys see my screen? Not yet. How about, how about now? Do you see anything? Nope. I do. Now I do things, sorry. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to start with a case. We've, we've had a lot of interesting stuff this week. And this is one, I'm going to start with the old abdomen and pelvis CT. And this is, I always tell my residents and fellows, go digging back to the original presentation because you never know what you're going to find. This is a guy that presented with flank pain, left upper quadrant flank pain, and he has this large left adrenal mass. And you can see that there's some high attenuation and presumably hemorrhage. And you would first guess that this is a pheochromocytoma, or sorry, um, uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma, maybe a pheo. Uh, but it turns out that this gets very interesting when you look at his lungs. And I'll show you in a second, because this is, this is coming from his adrenal gland. And uh, when you and he had been given a diagnosis before of emphysema, which everyone on here that is familiar with cystic lung disease recognizes this is not emphysema. And of course, this is a great look for Bert Hogby Bay. You can see these little visual and subplural kind of ovoid cysts, you know, not that many in number. And this is this is the follow-up study I saw. So this was a restaging exam, and now he has a little bit, you know, a few more cysts, but. This is a, a classic look for Bert Hogde Bay. And what was confusing was that it was an adrenal and not a renal tumor. And I went digging in the pathology, and you'll see that the pathology was that this was an oncocytic adrenal cortical tumor. And then he eventually had a genetics consult, and sure enough, strong family history of pneumothoraces, personal history of four pneumothoraces. He had as they described, hundreds of skin lesions. And of course, the geneticist was all over this too. And then they did the follicular and gene testing, and he did test positive for a mutation. So I had never seen or heard of adrenal tumors with this. It turns out around the same time, there was a paper that was published uh, from University of Michigan where they had an oncocytoma or oncocytic tumor of the adrenal gland also presenting nearly identical in a patient with Bert Hogg Dubay. So you can get you can get tumors in other in other organs too, but this they go into list that there are a couple of reports of other adrenal tumors. Because I, of course, when I saw these cysts, I went back and looked and said, well, this must be a renal tumor that was just, you know, obliterating the adrenal gland. But it was clearly adrenal in origin. So I just thought this was fascinating, you know, variant presentation of something that we see not infrequently. So. I don't know if you guys have encountered that before, but just store that one away for the next time you see um, a, a Berthog de Bay case. And yeah, and of course he had in the interim between the time he presented with that tumor and when he had it excised a few months later in 2012, he presented with a spontaneous hydropneumothorax. I'll include that. That's not the exciting part, but that was one of his his four hydropneumothorax or pneumothoraces that he had had. All right. Now this one, I'm I'm curious because we're still the the path is still cooking on here. But this is just an amazing radiograph. This one also came in Monday, about the same time as that case did. And the left. What's that? Give us a second to look. Okay. Well, five seconds. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So I think the, I, I think most people will immediately jump to the left upper lobe collapse which I, I think you can, everyone sees that there's volume loss here and you kind of have this, this veil-like opacity in the left upper hemithorax and you start to get a little bit of ellipsical here, not really much of one. But what's interesting and what caught my eye was at least two, three tumors that look to be in the left main stem bronchus here. And you know you could see a cutoff here, but then it looked like there's something here and, and almost a little pedunculated thing here. What really confused me, though, was when I looked at the lateral view, because this is the left main upper lobe continuum that you can see perfectly, you know, well here. It's not obliterated by those tumors. 
but nonetheless certainly thought that this was you know there was at least one if not many masses in that left main stem bronchus and so this was in the ed this guy got admitted he got a of course i don't who knows why they do a pe study for something like this because of course they're not after we tell them there's a big mass and left upper lobe collapse, they're still convinced there's pulmonary emboli or whatever. But, but you'll see that sure enough, there's a big mass obstructing the left upper lobe bronchus and you have complete collapse. And this is probably tumor and some mucus extending out through that bronchus. And then when you go more proximal, you can see Oops. multiple other masses in the airways. And the one that's sneaky though, and scary is this one in the right, main stem bronchus, which I'll show you the radiograph in a second. I think it's because it's overlying midline because of the shift um, that, that it's hard to see. So we, um, we, were, we had a bet, some friendly bets for drinks in the reading room on what this was. And it, I was looking through some airway, you know, up in my airway talk recently, and I keep reading that you can get multifocal squamous cell carcinoma of the airway in 10% of cases. I've never seen it. I thought maybe this was gonna be a squamous cell he's got clearly signs of aspiration or just reduced secretions here and then he had this nodule here but of course my my fellow made two very nice observations at least we thought at the time this thing we thought it, at this point they said this was a dark lesion on his skin we thought maybe it was going to be melanoma this turned out to be a sebaceous cyst there also looks to be a subtle lesion big mass in the liver here um, but to make a long story short, we still don't know what it is. He got sick really quick, though. Ended up with complete left lung collapse, and was on was on um, Heliox, the the you know the high flow oxygen with the helium to reduce resistance because of this. This had a ball valve effect on his right main stem bronchus too. No history of papillomatosis, and it doesn't really look like a lot of the papillomas we see. I don't know the. Um, the other thing that's being whispered from prelim path is there are a lot of small round blue cells, like this could be a lymphoma or, or small cell or something, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any, any observations or, or suggestions, but I will show you a sagittal view just to show, I think you, you, know, you can still see some of the left main upper lobe continuum right here, which I think is what you're seeing on the, on the lateral radiograph, which is why you still see that. It's just that you catch a, po a portion of it on FOSS here before you get the abrupt occlusion. Well, no mm -hmm. kidding. Yeah, that's, prox that's proximal to the occlusion. Very good point. Yeah, but that was a confusing, you know, quite a striking radiograph. And, and I'll update you guys when, whenever we get final path, but I thought it was really interesting. What's going on with this aortic arch there? Is, there, is that aortic arch sort of pinched looking there? Does he have some sort of a... You know... I, I was going to attribute it to just his his left upper lobe collapse and volume loss. I have no idea. It, it does look a little high. You know what he's got is a straight spine here. His spine is way deep. Uh, can can oh. we look at the spine on, a, on that sagittal? His narrow sure. diameter. The, the straight, yeah. your straight back syndrome, David? Well, th this one's not, not straight down below, but it's straight straight above. He's got a narrow, he's got a narrow yeah. diameter up high. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is that this looks like a, at this point on the, on your lateral view here, it looks as if there is sparing of the lingula. So the lingula is not involved in this collapse at this point. You can see that there's a fissure down below. And huh. you know, so basically there, you know, there's this uh, V-shaped thing, opacity going up. <clears throat> so I think he's had variable amounts of, of left lung yeah. collapse at yeah. the point you know, the, and this lateral it may not be the same as what you're showing on ct but that v-shaped yeah. thing is the right upper lobe pattern on the they're left only, yeah they're only a they're only a, an hour apart though i don't yeah. know yeah that's okay maybe some of this is lingula that's still yeah this still got some aeration in it i don't yeah huh. right but yeah but really a dramatic radiograph with those airway nodules and um oh i was going to show the pa view and show I think that one in the right main stem bronchus is right here, but it, again, that's really hard to see. I think it's a nice illustration of a displaced azagoesophageal recess to the left too. Yeah. So. So there is some preliminary path you said. It's not. It's not it's, a melanoma, by any chance. No, no, no. It's not because the thing on his skin turned out to be um, just a sebaceous cyst, and he has no other primary. They, there's some rumor whispers from the primary team of it being small round blue cells, but I, this was just excised on Tuesday or debulked. So I, I don't know yet, but I'll let you know when I do. Okay. Um, 
this one is more just, you know, it's it's really quite a tragic case and unfortunate, but I think it's it's the story that's kind of interesting with this. And for everyone else tuned in, this is a, a middle-aged man who's 59, lives in the Central Valley and presented to his doctor back in whenever this was, September, with short, shortness of breath cough, had a, had a unilateral right effusion and ended up getting a CT before he had a thoracentesis. And you can see that there's nodular pleural thickening. It's interrupted. I mean, this is a malignant effusion and there's really no differential you know, with these pleural masses, or at least I would say it's malignant until proven otherwise. His underlying lung is fine. Uh, they, they did a thoracentesis and it was, it was exudative, but they didn't get any cells. And somehow, just because he was from the Central Valley, they, they presumably, or they presumptively gave him a diagnosis of pleural coxy. And what's really unfortunate, this was his follow-up CT two months later, and the out outside report actually said, you know, these pleural masses are nonspecific, but could be seen in pleural coxy, which I think is false on two fronts, because number one, you know, I don't, and hopefully everyone agrees, whenever you see nodular pleural thickening, it's very specific for metastatic or malignancy, either primary or metastatic disease. And, uh, but they continued to treat him with antifungals. He didn't get any better. And this is when I saw him, you know, a month ago or less than a month ago. And now he just has a complete pleural rind, still nothing in the lung. And so it was either going to be mesothelioma or METs from a extra thoracic primary. And the surgeon was going in expecting this to be an empyema based on the reports. And I called him and talked to him. And sure enough, this was all mesothelioma in there. Uh, but you know, the literature will say that thoracentesis, which I think they only did one of, thoracentesis is only somewhere 60, 80, maybe 85% sensitive for malignant effusions. But I don't know. Is there anything else you would put on a nodular pleural thickening differential besides cancer? Because there's nothing I put on it. TB, it doesn't look like TB. It's they're too. It's almost too thick. Yeah. So, lymphoma. We've seen lymphoma. Yeah, sure. I would. I guess I would count that as a yeah as, as a malignant effusion, but certainly not. Yeah. Have, but Jeff, how how often do you see nodular pleural thickening with TB? Uh, well, usually, it's it's pretty smooth, but can be really a usually thick rind. Fusion, um, unless they get a tuberculous empyema. But um, you know, there's the. Um, there was a paper published out, I think, Japan, where they looked at uh, pleural lymphoma de de developing in patients with chronic uh, empyema, and many of those came from tuberculosis. But you're right. I yeah. mean, you look at that as cancer until proven otherwise. But right. just like you've shown, you showed that case of peritoneal carcinomatosis, well, alleged, it ended up being all TB. Right. So let's see. I'm going to keep going unless anybody else wants to. Well, I, I downloaded a few angiosarcs. Um, some, I think one of yours. Okay. I can show them at some point towards the end. I'll just show them with the with well, the. Yeah, let me. Um, I want to show this really quick because Sanjeev Bala had shown me a case similar to this a few months ago, and I'd never seen it. And this is just a little bit of a of a curiosity. I don't even know why we're doing this study. Uh, I don't remember what this guy's cancer was. I think this was just a restaging exam, but notice he's injected through the left upper extremity, and. He has contrast filling what at first glance you would think is a an accessory or a little tributary vein. But this is actually contrast that refluxes into his thoracic duct, as I think I can prove to you. It's this thing. And as you see it, you know, this definitely has the look and the location of a thoracic duct. So he had shown me one where there was a lot of reflux, but I think you can see it all the way down to here. And then it probably crosses and then we lose it a little. But I've been looking, this is the first one I've seen. I probably missed a few, but Presumably, there's just a valve that's incompetent in this patient that you get the reflux of contrast into the thoracic duct. But it's a nice illustration of just a reminder of where the thoracic duct actually communicates with the venous system. Have you guys looked for this or noticed this before? So I think it's kind of cute. Start looking now. now that you know it, I probably have missed it many times. <laughs> yeah, I well, I, I probably have too. I had never really thought of it before. I mean, the only the only time I look at the thoracic duct, or, or the time I think about it most, of course, is when patients have retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy and you're looking for like a Verkald node or something. But I thought this was just a cute example of that. You, would, you might see it in patients with an SVC syndrome with a left injection where you got you don't have time for collapse. Yeah. 
solution. That'd be interesting to look at those. I don't know. Keep an eye out for it. I will. Okay. We'll okay. Put a, yeah. So the, he didn't have any narrowing more proximally than that break his phallic vein or anything like that that would have promoted this. No, no. It looks like caliber all the way. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, it just is, is refluxing into his thoracic duct. All right, Jeff, let me show one more really quick because it's, it's pertinent to what we've been talking about. And this is one I saw, I don't know, a day or two ago, the VA. And this is, I don't remember why this patient is, is hospitalized, but he's got a radiograph, he's got small effusions. And then on the left side, he's got this peculiar band of atelectasis and you get a little bit of loss of the left heart border here. And I, you know, he'd had a bunch of studies. So it's just kind of like some atelectasis, maybe discoid atelectasis and effusions. But I saw this, um, this CT yesterday and I thought this was really cute because he, he had a recent abdominal surgery, I think is why he was in the hospital and they're just, he's dysmic and they're looking for PE. But, you know, David, this goes to what we were just talking about with left upper lobe collapse, mm -hmm. because now his, his left upper lobe is not collapsed, but he has like, I think this is just lingual collapse with, when you look back at his old CT that I'll show you and look on a sagittal that he has a left accessory minor fissure right here that you can see along as we extend out along his heart. So I think that this is just a, you know, he's just got collapse of this lingular segment, which has, you know, is, is well defined because of its own fissure. Mm -hmm. If you can see, let's see if I'm, and he also had some right, right, right here that I think is just collapse of this, of this portion of the lingula. It's interesting though, that his, his bronchus branching pattern looked a little, now that I look at it, it looked like the lingular portion was coming off a little low. I hadn't noticed that until now. Um, actually look at this on the axial views. <laughs> But I just thought it because you guys were we were showing all these airway variants. What do you yeah? What do you guys think of his airway? Well, he's got that anomalous left upper lobe bronchus. Yeah, like I showed. Where it's it it's off. coming off really late. Yeah, like a and it's like a well, he's got like a variant. It's like the, the apical posterior segment comes off, yeah, separately like that, and then you get this weird fissure on the left. Huh. Or you have a partial fusion of the left upper and lower lobes. It's, it's I've seen enough of those, but they send yeah. up have some we, some kind of weird segmentation anomaly of the left upper lobe. But yeah, but I know whatever it is, it's this weird portion of of lingula slash mm -hmm. middle lobe type of variant. But it, that's what's collapsed with that accessory fissure there. Yeah. So kind of it's simulating a right middle lobe collapse on the left. So yeah. cool. Yeah, Jeff, what's what is this? Yeah, this this late branching of the left upper lobe that comes off behind the artery. What's that called? I know there's a name for it. In some of the literature, it's referred to as a tracheal bronchus. And that's where you hear about the left tracheal bronchus. Because I looked back, and there were a couple papers, old ones. I found one large series from China where they described left tracheal bronchi. But I mean, I've never seen a real one. But then if you dig down, a lot of these, they did a lot of. Um, a couple sources I've seen have defined a tracheal bronchus as coming off the trachea or main bronchus, yeah. which makes no sense because then it's not tracheal. But I think that's the variant that gets counted as a left, a so-called left tracheal bronchus. I don't know what it's called, but it's I just call it an anomalous origin of the apical yeah, okay. bronchus, and it goes behind the artery, and usually the fissure up there is abnormal. Right, as this one is. So it's almost like the lingula is coming off the lower. So instead of having a standard, it, so it looks like the lower lobe and lingula share a common trunk. But I don't think there's yeah. a specific name for it. I, I thought I came across something where they had. Called what, it is, a, what does a coronal look like here? Travis, can you give us a coronal? Sure. Yeah, it's just a really long left main. So, yeah. And then this is like the apico posterior segmental bronchus here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's odd. But that's the exact same one that 
that tracheal bronchus I showed had with that anomalous left. Yeah. But on the right, it looks okay. Yeah. In this guy. Huh. But it looks like if the apical posterior is taking off before the anterior and lateral parts. Is that correct? Yeah, it kind of looks like that. Let me just... Which is, which is, what's the first branch off of that? Let me Let's just go into 3D so you can look at it on in, in all different planes. Let's see, the first branch right here, it looks like it's the, well, it looks like it's just the whole thing because even the anterior wraps around there. You guys agree? Yeah, I mean, it looks yeah, there it goes, and then then you get what looks like a normal bifurcation, but you just have the lingular branch. Is there even right? Is there an is there an anterior segment? And yeah, I think this, I think this kind of is right here, or if it's just all part of the apico posterior segment, it almost looks just, like the yeah, like the 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 what there's a the what is the upper lobe? Because see how early the fissure is. It looks. Yeah. The the lingula is sort of itself, and then the the up the rest of the upper lobe and the lower lobe are one unit. Yeah, maybe it is just an apico posterior segment, and then you have this lingula here with superior and inferior segments. Okay, that's what it looks like. Well, now anyway, you it was a vascular anomaly to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you uh, show another case or two here. Okay, I was just going to show some angiosarcomas. Um, actually, what, uh, this one is yours, Travis. Let me, let me load it up. And you probably showed it some time ago. Um, oops. No. Uh, there we go. All right, you should see a chest CT now. All right, so um, this patient had this big heterogeneous mass sort of in the right atrial region. There's the right coronary that you were talking about, Travis. You can see how hypervascular it is and um, just kind of dis distorts the wall, but um, you know, sizable um, coronary areas. But you know, if it's a right dominant system, I don't think those are particularly large. So that was one, but this one seems to have a lot more hypervascularity than the lymphoma case you showed. And then just to show another example, here's another one. I'll share the screen. This is an old case of mine from a long time ago. Um, but you can see this one had a much larger mass in the mediastinum, very necrotic looking, but, um, and this is probably a recurrence as I suspect there's already been a sternotomy, but there's a sizable right coronary going into this, but there's the hypervascular component, sort of disorganized vessels down there, there's lots of collateral flow. So I think that was also helpful. And then you can see he's got lung mets at the time here. So, all right. Well, uh, I think time's up, so um, uh, we'll continue next week. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.